Hello, in the previous video we talked about the photoelectric effect, how when a beam of light is shown on a piece of matter, we observe the liberation of photoelectron. I also mentioned that when physicists measured the rate and the speed of emission, they realized that something is wrong, The light doesn't seem to be a wave. But how did they measure the rate and the speed of emission? Ah, so now I'm going to talk about the experimental setup for photoelectric effect. So we start with the piece of matter on which we shine the beam of light on. Since photoelectrons are emitted from this plate, this plate is called the emitter. And then we arrange a second piece of matter here, the photoelectron. Since this is the plate where we collect the photoelectrons, this plate is called the collector. Now the next bit is quite ingenious. So what we do is we connect the collector back to the emitter with a piece of wire. And then we stick an emitter there. Oh, this is actually a microemitter because the currents that we are measuring, the so-called photoelectric currents, is usually quite small, a few microamps. Now, where does this current come from? Maybe this animation will make it clearer to you. So the photoelectrons that are emitted from the emitter gets collected here and it kind of completes the electric circuit. So you got electron flowing this way, which means a conventional current, the photoelectric current flowing the other way. Next, we can stick a battery into the circuit. Now, if you arrange the battery this way, such that the collector is at a higher potential than the emitter, we say that we have put a positive bias on the collector. If you flip the battery around, such that the potential of the collector is lower than the potential of the emitter, then we say that you have put a negative bias on the collector. So a typical experiment will involve us changing the biasing voltages and taking down the photoelectric current at every biasing voltage. The results of such an experiment is typically presented in an IV graph. And this is how a typical IV graph looks like. So what are the information we can extract from this IV graph? Now I want you to imagine lots of students trapped in a lecture theater. Every second, eight students are released from the LT. Just imagine there's a teacher in the LT who releases eight students per second. Now let's talk about the canteen. If you have eight students leaving the LT per second, are we going to have eight students arriving at the LT per second? Let's take a look. Oh, so you see, even though we have eight students leaving per second, you have only four students arriving per second at the canteen because some students just decide to go home, right? Or maybe some goes to the library or whatever. Now, what if we make the canteen somewhat attractive to the students? Maybe we offer free ice cream at the canteen. Now see what happens. Ah, now we get more students arriving at the canteen. Six students arriving at the canteen. Can we make the canteen even more attractive? Let's say we have Jay Chow holding a concert at the canteen. Oh, now you see all the students arrive at the canteen. What happens if we make the canteen even more attractive? Let's say uh, all students who arrive at the canteen will be exempted from the A-level exams and will be accepted into any university they want to go to. So this is what happens. So now all the students just sprint all the way to the canteen. But notice the number arriving per second is still 8. It didn't go up even higher. Because if all the students leaving the LT are already arriving at the CT, then you have hit the maximum, isn't it? Making the CT even more attractive only means that the students will arrive at a higher speed but not at a higher rate. So we have a similar situation in a photoelectric effect. The photoelectrons that are leaving the emitter, not all of them will be collected at the collector because some of them are just emitted in the wrong direction. So they miss the collector, they don't arrive there. Uh, another reason could be, even though we house this setup in an evacuator tube, meaning we have kind of a partial vacuum in the space between the emitter and the collector, but it's not a complete vacuum. There's still some air particles here. So for those photoelectrons that are emitted with a very low Ke, chances are that after some collisions with the air particles, they'll come to rest or some of them may even return to the emitter. So for one reason or another, not all the photoelectrons that are emitted are collected. So what do we do? We apply a positive bias on the collector. When you make the collector the positive plate, the photoelectrons will be attracted towards the collector. Remember, photoelectrons are electrons, so they are negatively charged. So they'll be attracted towards a positive plate. But as you can see, this positive bias is not enough, right? To collect all the photoelectrons. So what you can do, you increase the positive bias to maybe 2 volts. And now you see, ah, all the photoelectrons are collected. So we have hit what is called the saturation current. Because once all the photoelectrons that are emitted are already collected, even if you increase the positive bias further, right? If you increase 2 volts to 3 volts, you cannot increase the photoelectric current any further. It just means that photoelectrons 
will accelerate faster towards the collector but the number of photoelectrons arriving has hit the maximum it cannot increase anymore so what do we do with the saturation current now remember electric currents is just the rate of flow of charges so q over t since these are electrons and each of them carries a charge of e 1.60 times 10 to the power of negative 19 so you can write q over t as n over t times e n over t is the rate of emission of photoelectrons is the number of photoelectrons emitted per unit time. Take for example, if the saturation current is 1.6 microamps, then if you take 1.6 microamps divided by the charge of an electron, you get 10 to the power of 13 per second. That means 10 trillion photoelectrons are being emitted per unit time. That means the rate of emission of photoelectrons is 10 trillion per second. That's why the right hand side of your IV graph looks like this. As you increase the positive bias, the photoelectric currents will increase. But you hit a limit and the limit is called the saturation current. As I have described earlier, from the saturation currents, you can calculate N over T, the rate of emission of photoelectrons. Okay, what about the left hand side of the IV graph? Let's go back to our LT and canteen. Without making the CT attractive or not, let's say four students arrive at the canteen. But do you notice that some of them are more fit than others, right? Some of them run faster than the others. Now, what if we build the canteen on a higher ground? Let's say the canteen is on the second floor. Now, do you notice one of them decided to turn back? Because he's not fit enough to climb to the second story. So he returned to the LT. If we build the canteen on the third story, only two arrived because two have decided that the LT with the aircon is more comfortable, yeah? If you build the canteen on the third floor, now only one student arrived. If you build it on the fourth floor, all the students return. So what does this tell us? If you're talking about the fitness of all the students leaving the LT, even the fittest among them is not able to overcome the GPE barrier of four stories. My analogy is sounding a bit weird, but never mind. Let, let's go back to the photoelectric effect, yeah? Okay, we are now at zero bias, yeah? No bias. Notice the photoelectrons that are emitted, they are emitted with a range of initial Ke. Let's use some numbers, yeah? Suppose this represents photoelectrons with initial Ke of just under one electron volt, and this one just under two electron volts, this one just under three electron volts, and this one just under four electron volts. Okay, what do we do now? We apply a negative potential on the collector. If the collector is the negative plate, the photoelectrons will now experience a rightward electric force, right? Because they are negatively charged. And this is the negative plate. Now, if we make this the reference potential of 0 volt, then the collector is at a potential of negative 1 volt. So we have set up an electric potential energy barrier of 1 electron volt between the emitter and the collector. Why do I say that? Now remember, work done is Q times the potential difference. So by having a 1 volt potential difference between the emitter and the collector, a photoelectron will have to gain 1 electron volt of EPE in order to travel from the collector to the emitter. So that's what I mean when I say that there's an EPE barrier of 1 electron volt. So let's see what happens when there's this EPE barrier. Ah, do you see? This represents the photoelectrons which have been successfully repelled away from the collector. Because they left the emitter with Ke of just under 1 electron volt, so they will keep losing the Ke and gaining EPE as they travel towards the collector. But they lose all their Ke just before they arrive at the collector. So they come to a complete rest. But they are still in the electric field, right? So what happens next? They start to make the return journey back to the emitter. Now let's raise the negative potential to 2 volts. So what happens now? Even this one is not able to arrive at the collector. If you increase it to 3 volts, this one also gets turned back. So why is the amount of negative bias necessary to stop all photoelectrons from arriving? Yeah, 4 volts, right? Because remember I said that this one represents photoelectrons with initial K of just under 4 electron volts. When you have 4 electron volts of energy barrier, then even the most energetic of them do not have sufficient initial Ke to trade for the required gain in EP to arrive at the collector. So that's why the IV graph on the negative bias side looks like this. As you increase the negative bias, the photoelectric current will decrease. The negative bias at which the photoelectric current falls to zero is called the stopping potential, Vs. What do we do with Vs? We use it to calculate the maximum Ke of the photoelectron. Evs represents both the EP that must be gained by the photoelectrons and therefore also represents the Ke lost by the photoelectrons as they travel from the emitter to the collector. 
So if I were to summarize, all we have to do is to vary how the photoelectric current varies with the biasing voltages. On the positive bias side, we let the saturation currents tell us that every photoelectron that's emitted is already collected. And from there, we can calculate the rate of emission. On the negative bias side, we find out the stopping potential at which even the most energetic photoelectron fails to arrive at the collector. And we use EVS to calculate the speed of emission or the maximum KE of the emitted photoelectrons. Quite clever, right? Alright, that's all. Ta-ta!